morning. I'm so grateful to be here with you today. Um, before we start, would you pray with me once again? God, thank you for this time and place where we can share our story. I ask that you would guide our words. May they be gentle, honest, and relevant. Be here with us. Amen. Well, my name is Jeannie Choi, and as Glenn said, I'm a sophomore human biology major, and I am also a third culture kid. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the term third culture, so let me start there. David Pollock, a sociologist who writes about TCK, defines it as a person who has spent a significant part of his developmental years outside his parents' culture. The TCK frequently builds relationship with to all the cultures while not having full ownership in any. Within TCKs, there are different types, business kids, military or government, and missionary kids like myself. So, that, so that's the technical definition, but let me give you a more practical picture. Here are a few ways you know you're a TCK. You know you're a TCK when you think Visa is a document stamped in your passport, not a plastic card you carry in your wallet. You know you're a TCK when you get super confused because US money isn't color-coded and the nickel is bigger than a dime. You know you're a TCK when you know that McDonald's, Coke, and milk taste drastically different country to country. You know you're a TCK when you get nervous whenever a form needs you to enter a permanent address. And you know you're a TCK when you have a love-hate relationship with the question, where are you from? <laughs> when people ask me this question, where are you from? I tend to proceed by telling them a brief story of my life, and it usually goes something like this. I was born in South Korea, and at the age of two, our family moved to Mongolia. Both my parents are doctors, and in Mongolia, they did governmental volunteer work, much like Peace Corps. Also in Mongolia, my non-Christian parents met missionaries and came to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. This changed their lives, and after our three-year term in Mongolia, we moved to sunny California, where my dad attended Talbot. I was five when we moved here. Then, when I was 10, we moved back to Mongolia, this time for medical missions. I lived there for seven years before moving back to Biola. I give this mouthful of an answer because I have no answer. My passport is Korean, but I identify most with American culture, but I've lived most of my life in Mongolia. While I associate myself with all these cultures, and I dearly love them, I hesitate to say that any of them are mine. I think this is precisely what third culture is. So as I tell this story of my nomadic life to my newly acquainted friends, many are interested in Mongolia. Some ask me if Mongolia is a part of China, and I kindly explain no. Mongolia is an independent nation that's located above China, below Russia. Some ask me what language they speak in Mongolia, and I say something in the lines of, well, actually, they speak Mongolian. <laughs> this is usually followed by, can you speak it? Say something for me. Some ask me what it's like in Mongolia, and this is a hard one. If you were to ask, what's it like in America? Would one answer ever suffice? However, I tend to say something in the lines of, it's definitely a developing post-communist nation, or Mongolia seems like the most Western Asian country. Sometimes I talk about the negative 40 degree weather in the winter, because 10 years of that definitely gives you bragging rights. <laughs> and I love all these questions and interests people have about Mongolia. But many times, at the end of the conversation, my newly acquainted friend will say something like, wow, your life is so interesting. My life is so normal and boring. I've grown up in Whittier all my life, and the only international travel I've done is Mexico. This comment always strikes me, and here's why I think it does. My first response is to always recognize that my friend's life is very different from mine. I don't know what it's like to grow up in Whittier. I've never been to Mexico, and I haven't had the experiences my friend has had. 
So her experiences are interesting to me. I want to hear more about them. As I think deeper about this, I also realize that this phrase, your life is so interesting, makes me feel special. But I'm not special. Not in the superior sense of the word. In my experience this past year as I've adjusted back to Mongolia, I've noticed that this unqualified elevation of TCKs, and especially missionary kids, hinder hinders me from building relationships. When I share my shortcomings with people, I've gotten responses as, I've never expected you to be like that. You're a missionary kid after all. This makes me uncomfortable. I cannot meet the expectations to be special. Thankfully, I've had friends who treat me like friends, not as some wonderful and praiseworthy creature. I've had friends like Katie who has allowed me to be human. In fact, she looked me in the eye one day and told me, I don't expect anyone to not be a sinner. I am not special. Because I am not special, I can relate to you. I have a friend who grew up in a non-Christian home. My friend sometimes feels like she doesn't belong here at Biola. I don't think she expects me to understand what that feels like, but I understand her. I know so well what it feels like to not belong. I am not special and I can relate to you. We can have conversations and build a meaningful relationship. What a blessing relationship is for a transitioning TCK. I say, to say I am not special is not to say that I am not blessed. I am so blessed, so thankful for the life God has given me. Just as I am blessed, my friend who has grown up in Whittier is also blessed. My friend who grew up in a non-Christian home is blessed. Each of us has a story to bring to the table. I am not special, I am blessed. You are also blessed. Thank you. Wow. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Evan McGee. Um, I'm a junior business major, and I'm from Turkey. Uh, that's where I grew up most of my life. Um, I'm not, like, a public speaker. <laughs> I just want to, like, clear the air there. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I actually Googled... Um, before last night, I was like Googling like how to start a speech, even though it's like a 10 minute speech. And so here's, I found this website has five inviting ways to start a speech. <clears throat> Opening number one, the startling statistic. So I'm going to give you guys a startling statistic. Um, <laughs> so enjoy it. Uh, you have one in 2,067,000 it's supposed to say chance, chance of dying in a plane crash, and a one in 423,548 chance of dying from falling out of bed. Now, this really startled me because I sleep in a loft, and so I'm really scared now <laughs> of dying. Opening number two, ask a rhetorical question. I googled rhetorical questions, and I found... <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself? See, the point of this is like, it's a statement in a question. So, aren't you ashamed of yourself? What business is, what business is it of yours? Uh, how, did you get, how did that idiot get elected? And what is so rare as a day in June? Does anybody say that ever? <laughs> I never heard that before, but yeah, that's a, that's a rhetorical question. So, I could do that. Um, opening number three, ask for a show of hands. Could I have a show of hands? I like that one. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Number four is speak with your audience. I guess it means like say something at the same time or maybe have a conversation. So like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Good? Okay, cool. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Uh, and then opening number five is tell a story. So I thought I'd just tell a story and see if it worked. There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to start now that I'm done with that. Um, my story, so I'm four years old and... Uh, I move, um, I have four siblings and two parents, and we moved to Turkey on my fourth birthday, actually. I remember I was on the plane, I like slept on the floor, and it was my birthday, 
It was kind of funny. Um, I don't know why I remember that. I don't remember very much. But so we moved to Turkey. So I, I lived in Turkey for 12 years, ages 4 to 16. Um, and I think for me, I'm going to mostly talk about one of the biggest transitions of my life was when I was 16. Um, we moved back uh, to the Bay Area. That's where my parents were originally from. And, and Bay, yeah, uh, 510, OK. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so we moved back when I was 16. And I think one of the biggest struggles for me was seeing like the difference between, so I went to a, a very, um, let me say, not racially diverse church, very white church. In, it was in Oakland, though. And then my school was San Leandro High, which I was the one white kid in a class of 40. And so this, these are two very different like, demographics of people. And, and something that I experienced was, like, I eventually, I mean, at first I was, of course, really awkward. I was like thrown off by the, all the culture, and I'll explain that. But, but I actually made some friends in high school and in this church youth group I felt very excluded and left out because I fit in very well there. I was very, I'm very white. I'm very, I look the same as everybody, um, but I feel very different on the inside. Um, and I think that was, that had something to do with it. Uh, let me get back to my notes so I don't blabber. Uh, oh yeah, so, so when I first got there uh, to high school, now this is me first time in American public high school and I walk in, I have my first lunch and I know zero people. So, now this is before I watched the movie Mean Girls, okay? <laughs> I, sw I swear this is before I watched that movie. And so what happened was, I'm, I'm having my lunch, I get it from the cafeteria, and I'm like, what's up, like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I actually, I just, I didn't want, I didn't notice it with anybody. So I went, I actually went and sat down at first with some guys, and they looked at me real funny, so then I got up and left. And then I went and sat in the bathroom, and I ate my lunch my first day of class. That was actually my experience. And then I watched Mean Girls later, and then I was like, that's kind of funny. But <clears throat> uh, yeah. But then finally what happened was this one, this one really friendly girl approached me. It was one of my classes, and she's like, hi, I, I, I don't see you sitting with anybody at lunch. You want to sit with us? And she invites me into the friend group, and I make friends that way. And that was really cool for me that I was able to do that. Um, but I, my experience at this church was real difficult because, like, I didn't have, I didn't make any connections there. And I, in my mind, like, in Turkey, if you're part of the church, like, you have to be part of the church because you're committing your life to being a part of the church because... In Turkey, if you're a Christian, you're socially like an outcast. Like, does that make sense? Like, if you are a Christian, it, you don't belong anywhere. Um, and so, my experience, if someone's like, "I'm a Christian," it's like, "Dang, we have this connection. Let's go, like, be best friends, right?" With everybody who's a Christian. And here, I'm like, I walk into this youth group, and everyone's just like, "Oh, he's he's cool. He's normal." And they just have their own little cliques, and they move on with life. I'm like, "Well, I'm a Christian." <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was my, it was difficult. It was really tough. Actually, I went through a lot of doubt in terms of like who God is because like, you know, like if Christians are little Christs, who's Christ then? And if, if he's not, if these people aren't inclusive. Um, so that was a struggle for me. Um, so yeah, I want to, I want to share something real quick. This is, this is, uh, this is just a, a little differences between uh, Turkey and America. Can I get a male volunteer from the audience? Somebody who's brave and has a lot of gut? Thank you, sir. You want to come up here? Give him a round of applause. Okay. I, actually, I'm not going to move. Um, so we're going to demonstrate a greeting. Okay. This, now, you just be a, yourself now. Are you, are you a TCK by any chance? Okay, you're just a normal dude. <laughs> just kidding. We're all normal people, hopefully. Um, so what you're gonna do is we're gonna walk towards each other and pretend like pretend like we're good friends. All right. I don't. What's your name? Connor. Car Connor. Yeah. Okay. So Connor, you're just gonna say hi. Or, hi. However you say hi to you, a really good friend of yours. Okay. We're gonna walk by, pretend like we're just walking past each other. Ready? Go. Hey man, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing pretty good. That was good. Okay. All right. And now let's do. Now let's sit over there. Now let's do one where. Uh, we're, we're just friends, okay? We're not like buddies, but we're, we're friends, okay? Ready to go. Hey, what's up? What's up? Okay. <laughs> now, we're gonna pretend like I'm the guy in the cafeteria, like you don't know me at all, I'm the guy in the cafeteria who always sings opera, you know that guy? <laughs> <laughs> so you know my face really well, but you don't know me, so you're not sure what to go ahead and, and try and say hi to me. Hey. Good. Okay, so, so we see, thank you very much, Connor. Actually, wait. Stay right there. One second. Now I'm going to show you guys what we do in Turkey. Okay? This is this this is if he, you're my really good friend. Okay? So just go along with this. If it's real difficult, just do your best. All right? So ready? Walk by. 
Aa ne haber arkadaşım iyi misin? Allah Allah ya ya gel buraya gel gel gel. That's my good friend, okay? And now we'll show and and that's rude if I don't do that. Oh my gosh, he's gonna have a real fit. So now be uh, now just be a good friend, ready? Arkadaşım nasılsın iyi misin? Ya, ben de iyiyim hadi gel gel beraber gidelim. <laughs> and now an acquaintance. Now uh, notice the big difference here between these. I'm not I'm not I'm just saying these are cultural differences. Ready now we're acquaintances. Ah uh, merhaba nasılsın iyi misin? Ben de iyiyim hadi görüşürüz. Like that. So notice how like even his high bro to his good friend was just a nice. Right and I do that too. So now I'm not saying like I'm a I'm a thank you Connor. Do it. <laughs> I'm a chameleon in some ways. I very I adapt very well to different scenarios. And so here at Biola, when I see my good friend, I say, sup, bro, and I keep walking, like, because that's what people do. Um, and so I've, I've learned to adapt. Oh, I thought you were okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I've, I've learned to adapt a lot. And that's just, that's just something that, um, yeah, like, I think, I think that it's something interesting that blew my mind. When I came here, people wouldn't greet. Like, and another thing, like in Turkey, the way that we greet people, you walk into a room, in America we go, what's up guys, hey, we sit down, right? In Turkey we go, ah, oh, no, 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 shake everybody's hand in the room. Now that makes sense. And you have to stand, everybody else, you guys should be standing up right now since I walked in the room. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like this whole, these, these concepts are like, are my, and that's just like greetings now. Now we can go further, but we're not going to. Um, yeah, so just something I want to encourage you guys in is like, as Christians, be open to other cultures because like, we have things to learn from them. I, so here's something I learned from American culture that I'd say is very good. Let me tell a real quick story. When I was in uh, first grade, me and my brother, my brother's better at Turkish than me. I'm still kind of learning the uh, abejes, ABCs. Um, and so my, the teacher's talking in Turkish. I turn around and look at my brother. I was like, what is, what is he saying? I say that in English. The teacher comes. Now, this is just my experience in, in first grade. The teacher comes over. He picks us up by the ears, walks us to the front of the class, has us put our hands out. This is for talking in class because there's two rules. Uh, the law of the class can be summarized in two commands. Be quiet and listen. And so, so we stand there, and our hands are out like this. And he goes to his desk and takes the ruler. I've seen him do this before to other kids. Usually, I wasn't the one up there. And, he, and we have our hands out, and he goes, one, two, three, right on our hands. And that was for talking in class. Um, and that's part of the way I grew up. So I just want to say, like, when I, coming here, I see the freedom in speech. And for me, that was amazing. Like, I go to this high school, and the teachers want me to say my opinion? <laughs> Crazy. I, I mean, I did some homeschool, so it wasn't like a completely new concept, but it was, it was interesting to see these, these huge public schools that want you to have an opinion. I mean, I know that causes a lot of problems for Biola because then people have opinions that we don't agree with, but still, it's, it's a really good thing. And I, I think I, that's something I've learned from this culture is to, to actually have my opinions and express those um, clearly. And so, yeah, I, I just want to encourage you guys, when you meet someone from a different culture, as, as uh, Jeannie was saying, don't, I mean, you can ask them if you're curious, but get to know them and actually learn from like experiences that they have or ways that they're um, acting. Cause that, that, you can learn a lot from, from those kinds of cultures and people of different cultures. Thank you. Hi everyone. That's a really hard act to follow. I don't know. My jokes are gonna be a little flat now. Um, my name is Stephanie, and I'm so thankful to be here with you guys today. I'm the Director of Global Student Services here at Biola, and um, I get to interact with international students and TCKs all over campus, and it's such a great position. Today, I just want to give you a quick snapshot into my childhood. Um, maybe we would say this is my Facebook post of childhood. Um, Imagine if you can, every day, walking home from school with your older brother. It was about two miles from our elementary school to our house, and we had a key. 
because our parents, of course, were at work. And we would let ourselves into our house, grab a snack, and immediately run outside to play with our friends. The whole neighborhood was outside. We played football and volleyball and anything having to do with the ball. It was just so much fun. And as we got older, um, my brother and all his friends started getting into explosives. And they started blowing up things. And <laughs> homemade dynamite was a normal feature on our street. Um, I lost many a Barbie to their antics. <laughs> it's really, really sad. You might be asking at this point, what about homework? Didn't we have any homework to do? Of course we had homework, but no one was there to tell us to do it. So we just went along our way and played and destroyed things. Once we had a BB gun fight. Do you guys know what BB guns are? We had a huge BB gun fight, and for some crazy reason, I got hit with a BB gun right here. Big BB in my arm. We pulled that thing out. It was nice. We also played with darts. For some reason, I always got hit with things. I got hit with a dart in my other arm. I don't know why I was in the crossfire, but you, this gives you a big picture of like our neighborhood, right? Everyone was on the streets. Everybody's parents worked. We were off on our own all the time. And we wreaked havoc on the neighborhood. Um, I can't tell you all the things that we did. Um, as we played, all of the cooking smells started to emerge from our neighborhood. Our Filipino neighbors were cooking, um, oh, look from Filipinos, woo -woo. Our Filipino neighbors were cooking chicken adobo with rice and it smelled so good. Um, it motivated us to play harder in our games for sure. And soon we heard a bell ringing in our neighborhood, ring, ring, and a man yelling, tamales, tamales. He came with his cart down our street and I was like, I want a tamale so bad, it smells so good. Um, but I waited because I knew dinner was coming soon and my mom would be very angry if I spoiled my appetite. And then our other friend um, across the street from us, from Saipan, came out her, outside her door and said, hey, you guys, you want some fried Spam? I just cooked it up. And I was like, ooh, maybe not the fried Spam. I'll go for the tamales. But <laughs> everyone has their thing, right? Um, so this was our neighborhood. Around 5 p.m., our parents came home, my brother and I, and we went inside. This signaled dinner time for us. Um, and the smells inside our house were not quite as appetizing. You see, my father's family grew up in southern culture in Georgia. And so we had a lot of pork chops, collard greens, black eyed peas, and a lot of casseroles. Oh, I hate casseroles now. Don't ever invite me over if you're going to serve me some casserole. I remember tuna fish casserole with potato chips on top. It was disgusting. Soon as, we, as the sun was setting, the cumbia and mariachi music started from our Mexican neighbors. And the Polynesian family behind us had a very eclectic mix of R&B and reggae and their own traditional music. They turned it up really, really loud to try to drown out the cumbia. It was like a war of bands in our neighborhood every night. And soon there was a police helicopter circling our neighborhood with a spotlight down on us. Um, pretty much two to three times a week that was out there. And you know, for us, it was like, hey, the police, they're out there again. Usually it was my mom that called them too, because she was like, can they turn down their music? It's 3 a.m. Does this give you a good picture of my growing up life? You may be wondering where this is. Um, not too far from here, Long Beach, California. Long Beach. Now, there are many facets of Long Beach. You know, you can go see downtown Long Beach. That's not where I grew up. I grew up in North Long Beach. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Woo -hoo. That's awesome. Um, in our neighborhood, there were so many different family styles, music styles, food styles. And for us, it wasn't bad or good. It just was the way it was. We lived in a diverse place. At our local school where my brother and I attended, I was one of the two white people in my class. As you can imagine, growing up in such diversity was kind of confusing for me in terms of my identity. With my green eyes and my dirty blonde hair, I was the minority in this setting. Yet, when I was, when I was younger, I didn't quite understand that I was white. Actually, in my mind at that time when I was younger, I thought everyone with darker hair, like brown or black hair, was Mexican. And I don't know where I got this idea, strange, but I had it in my head. And so since both my mother and my father have dark hair, I thought my parents were Mexican too. 
I remember drawing a picture of my family where everyone in my family, including myself, had dark hair. I dreamed of having dark hair all my life because in my mind, it was the symbol of beauty and grace. And I was an ugly outcast for some reason having lighter hair. When I drew this picture, my friends asked me, why did you draw your family that way? I mentioned how everyone with dark hair was Mexican like my parents, and I wanted to be Mexican like my parents, so I drew dark hair. Can you imagine my friend's responses? They laughed so hard. They fell on the floor laughing hysterically. You're not Mexican, they said. Your parents are not Mexican, they said. So dumbfounded, I was like, they're not, really? <laughs> what are they then? What am I? And then the word came out, white. Confused, I remember thinking, what is white? I mean, my friends are Mexican, Filipino, Saipanese, Hawaiian. They all had a country or a place associated with how they called themselves. But I was white. Where was white from? Suddenly, I was aware of some appearance difference in myself. I didn't feel any different from my friends. We all shared our lives together every day. We ate a little bit different food, but everybody ate different food. But apparently, I looked very different. Apparently, I was white. As you have heard today, and even if you came last week, there are many diverse stories of people who, have, who grew up in two to three different cultures. And this highly impacts their identity, who they view themselves to be, how they view others. As you can imagine, we also can say this can be true for me. My childhood was one filled with a myriad of diverse languages and cultures, foods, perspectives, economic situations, and faiths. Yet we all lived in the same neighborhood, played on the same street, and shared our lives with one another. In many ways, this created a new culture for us, a culture of diversity, a culture in Long Beach that shaped my identity. So can I say that I'm a TCK? I think so, actually. Um, growing up in such a diverse environment propelled me into this category in some way. In many senses, I didn't have a choice. We don't ask to be born where we're born. We don't ask to be born to the parents that we're born to. We don't ask to be born with dark hair or blonde hair. I did not choose any of these things. I was born into them. But as an adult, I question more about my TCK identity. Did I have a choice? As I look at the divergent paths of my life versus my brother's life, I see that I did have a choice. You see, my brother and I, although we grew up in this same environment, same friends, same parents, same school situation, my brother and I are completely different. We have completely different stories. Why, you may ask. Well, in my opinion, we were both given a gift, the gift of a diverse background, the gift of diversity, and yet, we made different choices with that gift. I chose to embrace the diversity and dig deep into it to try to understand what it meant to grow up in this multicultural environment. To really understand that everyone is created equal and there are no value judgments on your personhood. Really digging deep into that my whole life. Yet my brother, he made a different choice. He made a choice to ignore and disengage completely. I don't know why my brother chose to disengage. I can't speculate as to his story. But all I can say is that I am so thankful that I chose to engage. Why? Because although diversity is difficult, Although being a multicultural person is difficult because there are, there's so much dissonance in culture and people, I actually believe that diversity is the vehicle God uses to shape us into the people he wants us to be and a community that he wants us to be. Not because diversity is just hip or cool, 
but actually because it is a catalyst for holiness in our lives, the holiness that God desires from us. Diversity is a gift. Some of us are born into it. Some of us have to seek it out, but we all have the choice to embrace it, to engage with it. Embracing others who are different from yourself and seeking to learn from them, not just about them, is God's desire for people, to shape us into the people and the community that he wants us to be, a kingdom community. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.